how did our fish ancestors make the transition onto land? And what did they look like? We were still looking for our elusive fossil, frozen forever on the brink of this great transition. Each summer, we return to Jason's ancient riverbed to continue excavating. We needed to move lots of rock to expose the narrow seam containing the fossils. But then, we'd switch to brushes and dental picks to uncover the delicate fossilized bone. This is an incredibly funny paradox. You know, we're in this huge landscape. We're always crammed together, you know. Our, my head's next to Ted's feet. Marcus's head's next to my feet. It's this tiny little spot. It was in such a tiny corner of this vast landscape that we finally struck gold. Well, it was the second week of July in 2004. We're all working in series in this hull. And Steve says, hey, guys, what's this? Ted and I go running over. And what we saw was this V here. It was covered with rock. And as soon as we saw this V and we saw these teeth under it, it became very clear that this little V we're seeing is the tip of a snout and that this was a snout of a flat-headed fish. We stopped in our tracks. A flat head was a likely sign of a transitional fish. Here was the snout of exactly the creature we were looking for, and it was sticking out of the rock. So if we had any luck whatsoever, the rest of the creature would be, you know, encased in the rock. So we dug all the way around the fossil, leaving a chunk of rock that we then encased in plaster. We couldn't wait to see what was inside. Okay, we get home. We knew we had a flat-headed fish, but how much of it did we have? Well, then the preparators had to take over. They removed the plaster jackets, and the first thing they did was to etch away at the rock, exposing the front part of the snout. Then about a month and a half goes by, and they start to find the orbits, the eye holes. And then we see the shoulder, and then we see the fins, and then we see more and more and more and more until we see pretty much uh, the entire top side of the body. What's really wonderful about this specimen is that we have the head connected to a body and the body is connected to the fins. So we know that this fin comes from this animal and we know its size and how it fits together. Later, we found parts of other specimens and some of these were really big, up to nine feet long. The local Inuit people named our fossil Tiktaalik which means large freshwater fish. And as we took stock of our discovery, the real excitement began. Here was an animal Darwin had predicted, a real anatomical mixture. It had some features of fish, like scales and fins and gills. It also had lungs for breathing air. And to our astonishment, it had a neck, the earliest one like ours ever found. But inside the fins lie the clincher. We see an early version of Owen's one bone, two bones, lots of bones pattern that we see in our own limbs today. It even had a kind of wrist, the first signs of a link to the human hand. Every time you flex your wrist or shake your head, you can thank Tiktaalik and its Devonian cousins adapting to life in these ancient streams. Unlike other fish, Tiktaalik could use its neck to watch out for predators and to hunt smaller prey. And because those fins were strong enough to lift its body out of the water, a whole new frontier opened. Over millions of years, the two pairs of fins in fish like Tiktaalik would lead to the two pairs of limbs in every bony animal on Earth. It's a powerful legacy we can see in our own arms and legs today. Well, to think about Tiktaalik, think about this. Think about a push-up. What are we doing when we do a push-up? 
We're using the muscles that attach to our chest and attach to the underside of our arm to give us the power to raise up. We use our elbows and use flexion at the wrist, which is very important because it allows our palm to contact the ground. Here's the fin of Tiktaalik. And what does it have? It has a massive surface for connection of muscles that would attach the shoulder to the underside of the upper arm. It has evidence of a highly mobile elbow, and it even has a wrist that can flex so that the equivalent of the palm can contact the ground. Here's a fish that can do a push-up. I remember looking at the wrists of Tiktaalik for the first time, and at that moment, I felt akin to what I felt in the anatomy lab when I saw the cadaver and its hand. The hand actually defines us in many ways. But when you think about what makes our species unique and special, it's having thoughts and being able to make those thoughts real. And the way our thoughts become real is through use of our hands to build things, to make things. Yet the basic form of this wonderfully complex, quintessentially human piece of anatomy can be traced back to the fins of ancient fish. It's an incredible evolutionary story that we can now unravel. When Tiktaalik was first conceived, like every animal that has ever lived, it started as a single cell, which slowly formed into a body. Small buds appeared, and genes like sonic hedgehogs shaped them into fins. Over millions of years, fins like these evolved into a myriad of forms. Like the limb of this early amphibian with eight fingers. As millions more years passed, new variations emerged. From the clawed limbs of reptiles that would colonize dry land. To the powerful arms of primates that could traverse through the trees. Until eventually, a remarkable piece of anatomy arose that would itself transform the world. The human hand. This history is not just in our bone, flesh, and muscle. It's in our DNA. And that's what connects us all the way back to our inner fish.